Ben Franklin's World and the Doing History to the Revolution series are productions of the Omohundro Institute. And this episode is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 165 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Between 1763 and 1848, many revolutions took place in North America, South America, the Caribbean, Africa, and in Europe. So why is it that we only seem to remember three revolutions? The American Revolution, the French Revolution, and the Haitian Revolution. And given that the American Revolution took place before all of these other revolutions, what was its role in influencing this larger period of revolutions? Did it even influence this larger period? Our exploration of what the American Revolution looked like within the larger period known as the Age of Revolutions continues. In episode 164, we stepped into the Caribbean to investigate the successful Haitian Revolution and the unsuccessful revolution in Guadeloupe so that we could see the similarities, differences, and connections they shared with the American Revolution. In this episode, we'll spend most of our time in Europe, where many different revolutions took place during this era of revolution. And among the questions that we're going to investigate is, why exactly did so many revolutions take place during this period? Janet Pulaski, a professor of history at the University of New Hampshire and author of Revolutions Without Borders, The Call to Liberty in the Atlantic World, will serve as our guide for this exploration. As we explore this period in greater detail, Janet reveals information about the Age of Revolutions and why it took place, how the American Revolution fit within the Age of Revolutions, and how revolutionary ideas and revolutions spread across the Atlantic world. But first, one of the great aspects of producing this podcast is that I need to keep a wide view of the field of early American history. In an effort to answer all the questions you pose to me and all the topics you request for this show, I need to know which historians are working on what aspects of history and to keep an eye out for all the new books and exhibits that they're producing. It's in doing this part of my job that I've noticed an increase in the number of works that explore the American Revolution with some sort of international or global lens. And as it turns out, I'm not the only historian who's noticed this trend. I recently spoke with my Omohundro Institute colleague, Paul Mapp. Paul is the Omohundro Institute's interim editor of books, an associate professor of history at the College of William & Mary, and the author of The Elusive West and the Contest for Empire, 1713-1763. He's also presently working on an international history of the American Revolution. So I asked Paul whether he had any ideas for this episode and whether he happened to see the same trend that I was seeing in the field. We had such a fascinating conversation that I asked Paul if he would join us to have it again. After all, the purpose of the Doing History to the Revolution series is to explore not just the history of the American Revolution, but the histories of the American Revolution. So I think it makes a lot of sense for us to explore this new landscape in the histories of the revolution. So before we have our conversation with Janet, let's have a quick chat with Paul so that we can get a better sense of the newest development emerging in the literature of the American Revolution. Paul, thank you so much for joining us and for taking the time to answer a few questions that we have about a new type of historical genre that we see developing. As I'm sure you've noticed, over the last couple of years, it really seems like more and more historians are investigating the impact of the American Revolution on the Age of Revolutions. So to begin, what was the Age of Revolutions? And aside from the American Revolution, just how many revolutions were there? You know, I think about that kind of question from time to time. And I think one reason is that I don't know that there's a simple agreed upon definition of what the age of revolutions is, what the revolutions that make it up are, and when it ends. So I won't dodge the question, but I'll give you a little sense of some of the different ways I might answer that or some of the different ways that other people might answer it. I think a simple way to think about the age of revolutions 
is roughly from the end of the Seven Years' War, so up into the early stages of what we know in retrospect is going to become the American Revolution in the 1760s. I think up through at least Latin American independence for most of what become the countries of Latin America in the 1820s. I think that's a fairly safe definition. Some folks would extend this as far as 1848 and the different political disturbances in Europe at that time. I think some folks, maybe folks who focus more on Europe, would not go as far as the 1820s. And some folks might go through Reconstruction you know, or the Civil War. So I think what's true is you can get a lot of differences of opinion over what constitutes a sort of coherent period or age of revolutions. But I think a good sort of center of gravity definition would be roughly the 1760s up through the 1820s. So this was a big period. I mean, we could be talking about, you know, nearly 100 years of history when we refer to the age of revolutions. We could be. And we could also, your question about how many revolutions were there, you know, I don't think I could give a clear answer to that. There's a couple of reasons for that. What constitutes a revolution? When I think about it for some of the topics I'm working on, I have a slightly more capacious or maybe more flexible definition. I look at revolutions like the American Revolution, the French Revolution, something that pretty clearly involves substantial change in the distribution of power among different groups in a society where you know people who maybe were at the lower end of the social scale, maybe they move up a position or two, or maybe they even move to the top of the social scale. So there are classic revolutions like that. There are also different reform movements around different parts of the Americas, Europe, and I think possibly beyond. Uh, some of those don't become revolutionary. Some of them do. Some of them go so far, but not beyond. But I consider those relevant to some of the questions we're concerned about when we look at the American or the French Revolution or the Haitian Revolution, for example. And then there's also the question of independence, which may be tied up, and I think is often tied up with reform movements or revolutionary movements, but doesn't necessarily have to be. So I often talk in cumbersome sentences about revolutionary reform and independence movements. And the reason I talk about all of them, again, is because I think they're relevant to one another. And what something became or how far it went, we can see in retrospect, but they couldn't always see at the time. Something that turns out from our point of view to have been a failed reform movement might have seemed like it was going to become a revolution. So that somewhat more spacious definition means it's really difficult to say how many revolutions we're talking about. And if you start to extend your interest into parts of Europe, like Italy, for example, I have no idea. <laughs> you know, that place is still a labyrinth for me. So just figuring out your kind of basic definitional questions, I think would have to precede a simple answer about number of events. And in the end, what this really gets you to is different historians are going to have different definitions depending on what they're emphasizing and what they're looking at. Speaking of historians, what about this burgeoning literature that they've been publishing about the impact of the American Revolution on this period? Would you tell us a bit about the research that they're conducting on this subject? Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that as well, because it's something that's really caught my attention in recent years. I've taught a graduate seminar every couple of years about, I think I'd call it international approaches to the American Revolution. You know, the first time I taught this, I had to look around a little bit for books that I thought had a kind of international approach either to the American Revolution itself or that were dealing in a kind of comparative or integrative way with this larger age of revolutions. And with each year, there's more and more books available. And I think the next time I teach this course, I'll probably be able to assign, you know, 14 books that were published in the last three or four years. Now, I was thinking about how you would categorize these different books. And there's a lot of different ways you can do it. But a couple things that, you know, I've noticed. One thing you see is various comparative treatments of revolutions at this period. So you look at the American Revolution, you put it alongside the French Revolution, you talk about differences in the political ideas that animated them, differences in the amount of violence that characterized events, differences in the aftermath or how far the revolution went. So all kinds of comparative studies, often involving the American Revolution, but not necessarily. I think another category of books would look at sort of common features or common characteristics of these different revolutionary movements. So for example, you might have books that talk about the fact that you know, in France and maybe in different countries in Spanish America and in the 13 colonies, a lot of people read Montesquieu or maybe they read John Locke. So maybe they studied the same, you know, Roman classics, the folks who received that kind of education. So you might talk about intellectual commonalities or one thing that some people talk about, including, I think, some folks who've been on your show, 
is in some cases there's sort of similar circumstances in these different revolutionary situations. So for example, there's a number of European empires in the 1760s, 1770s that are really concerned about raising revenue and covering some of the debts they incurred during the Seven Years' War or in military buildup or reconstruction afterward. And so they're looking at their, in some cases, their colonial possessions, their imperial possessions, their outlying possessions, and trying to find ways that can maybe squeeze a little more revenue out of these areas. And there's a kind of commonality of process there that may have some similar effects. Then I think a third is people who look at the connections among these different revolutions. So, for example, someone like Lafayette is in France, and then he's in what becomes the United States, and then he's back in France. And he's someone who's involved in different revolutionary events in different sides of the Atlantic. And there's lots of people who are in that circumstance. Similarly, there are folks, for example, in the Dutch Republic who are reading about what's happening in North America and are influenced by that. So events in different places can be connected by people, by ideas, by commerce, and so on. Related to that, although I think still in the same analytical categories, I think there's been a number of works looking at the influence of, for example, American revolutionary events in more far-reaching, and in some cases, I think, very interesting ways. So, for example, not just thinking about the way the American Revolution set the stage for United States history, but also the way something like the Declaration of Independence, for example, the way that could be an influence or a model really for peoples and places for many decades, even centuries, in many places. So a real sense of the kind of wide-ranging and long-lasting influences of revolutionary events in America or could be France as well. And I think a fourth category, and one which I've heard you talk about with folks on the show, is I think books that look at the American Revolution, but in a much wider geographic frame. So you think about a classic approach to the American Revolution, maybe to the Revolutionary War, or maybe even to events leading up to the Revolution and then events following it, might really focus on the eastern seaboard of North America, the old 13 colonies, maybe a little bit west of the Appalachians. And now you're seeing books that in really interesting ways take in, you know, a good part of the North American continent that move down into the Gulf of Mexico. There might be sort of a continental frame or there's other books that retain and do more, I think, with the British imperial frame. And this has been going on for some time. Well, folks will talk about the 13 colonies that rebelled, as well as all the British colonies that did not rebel. And then we'll continue to look at that now broken British imperial framework in the aftermath of the American Revolution. Or they'll look at people who were part of the British Empire, who were loyalists who then left the 13 colonies that became the United States, and then are still moving around different parts of this British imperial world. And then I think the last two categories that came to mind, I think we could probably come up with more. There's a number of books that I think in really intellectually interesting ways try to redefine our sense of what the revolution was and what the sort of constituent parts of it were. So, for example, you know, I often tend to think of the United States coming out of the revolution as essentially a union, you know, as essentially one country. There is, of course, and always has been a different view of this that really emphasizes the states as kind of different actors coming together in something maybe closer to the European Union than to a kind of unitary state. And different scholars have experimented with talking about the American Revolution much more in terms of different states coming together, really in a kind of diplomatic or sort of international relations way, which is, it's not unheard of in American history, but can give kind of a different emphasis and can raise some interesting questions about it. And then the last category, I think, is looking at the revolution through the lens of international relations or foreign relations, you know, relations between France and what becomes the United States or what then is the United States, great power politics, you know, the maneuvering of the British and Spanish and French empires with these smaller polities becoming independent or trying to become independent and looking at that within the sort of framework of the history of foreign relations. There's always been books like that and they continue to come out. I think they're being enriched by the other international treatments of this revolutionary period. You just listed about six different categories of books that take some sort of international approach to the American Revolution. What do you think is driving this new, more expansive look at the American Revolution? Yeah, I was hoping you'd ask that question because it's what I speculate about. And I think there's some straightforward answers and there's some more subtle answers. When you talk about the American Revolution, I think one you know, fairly straightforward answer is that you know, if you think about the writing on the American Revolution as a forest, 
lot of really big, tall, deeply rooted trees, and they soak up a lot of the sunlight. It's hard, I think, for younger or just current scholars of the revolution sometimes to have just enough space to work because of these towering monuments of scholarship. And so people have different solutions to this. You know, they kick these big old trees. You see these big trees fighting each other like some nightmarish vision out of a children's movie where their branches entwine. But I think what you're also seeing, and this is, I think, more relevant to your question, is that a number of scholars are just sort of moving slightly to the side out of the shade of these bigger trees. And they're trying to find topics that are a little bit outside the areas of interest of some of the older revolutionary scholarship. So, for example, a lot of the great works on the American Revolution, they weren't just written in English, but they rely almost exclusively, in some cases exclusively, on sources in English. If you move out to sources in French or in Spanish or a number of other languages, all of a sudden you have a new set of documents that may illuminate revolutionary events or revolutionary issues. You may get different perspectives. You can talk about, again, different aspects of international relations, of commerce, of Spanish and French aid for the rebels, for example. So moving internationally into different sources and comparing the revolution with different events around the world, it can give scholars a little room to work some opportunities to see problems from a different way, or just to talk about things that haven't been talked about and probably should have been. There's some other reasons which I think are more subtle, but I think are quite important as well. You know, one is just that there has been a general movement in writing about American history in the last 10, 15, 20 years to try to internationalize thinking and writing about American history to see the United States as it's connected to other parts of the world, as it stands in comparison to other parts of the world, or even to think about the United States itself in international terms, you know, as a conglomeration of states, or as a lot of folks are talking about the United States acting in a kind of imperial fashion in North America, in a way I think it's a little different than they would have, say, 30 years ago. And so you can see this attempt to see the American Revolution from international perspectives or in an international context as part of this larger movement within American history to kind of branch out into different areas and see the connections between events and what became the United States and what was the United States and other parts of the world. And I think we could probably go farther and farther, but I think those are two of the most straightforward ones. I suspect the third is just the dynamic of the scholarship itself. You know, if you look, for example, at some of the older works about the American movement, some of the classic works with people you've talked with or talked about on the show, folks like Bernard Balin, Pauline Mayer. You know, I remember when Bernard Balin was on the show, he was talking a little bit about Denmark. Pauline Mayer, you know, talked at different times in her writings about the importance of Corsica to the American revolutionaries. And those topics, which might get a couple of paragraphs, a footnote, a couple of pages in those books, naturally scholars who are looking for ways to contribute might say, well, maybe I should take a longer, a deeper look at this. So rather than going over the same ground that someone like Pauling Mayer went over so well, I'll take something she talked about a little and I'll go and talk about it a lot. And that'll give me some space to make my own contribution. So I think you're seeing that as well. And I guess probably the fourth and last thing, you know, I think naturally because of the prominence of both Atlantic history, that is this look at the history of the early modern Americas and early modern West Africa and Western Europe, in this kind of Atlantic framework, looking at the interactions of all the different parts of the Atlantic Basin, and I think the sort of larger framework of global history or world history that's been interesting. So many scholars for all kinds of different periods, I think particularly in the last couple of decades. I think it's just natural when people begin to work and talk in those terms, you're going to start to look at the American Revolution. You're naturally going to start asking, how would it look in a kind of wider frame? Just because that's a kind of investigation that historians are conducting for all kinds of topics in different places in different times. So we're partaking, I think, of that general intellectual movement. There is definitely a new development in the scholarship of the American Revolution. Over the last few years, we've seen more and more books that explore the revolution through an international lens. We're seeing this new literature appear as historians search for new ways to better understand well-trodden ground, and because our present circumstances encourage us to explore how American history fits within world history. Now, I also asked Paul what he thinks looking at the American Revolution within the larger international context of the Age of Revolutions adds to our understanding of the event. And I asked him to tell us about his current research project, 
which is an international history of the American Revolution. You can hear the rest of this conversation for free in the OI Reader app, where you'll find it embedded with other great resources that complement and expand upon the information we explore in this episode. You can download the OI Reader app for free from your favorite app store or by visiting benfranklinsworld.com slash OI Reader. And now, let's go meet Janet Pulaski and explore her ideas about how the American Revolution fits within the larger age of revolutions. Joining us is the Presidential Professor of History at the University of New Hampshire. Her research interests include 18th century Atlantic revolutions, urban history, and comparative history. She's the author of five books, including Reforming Urban Labor, Roots to the City, Roots in the Country, and most recently, Revolutions Without Borders, The Call to Liberty in the Atlantic World. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Janet Pulaski. Thank you. Now, in Revolutions Without Borders, Janet notes that between 1776 and 1804, the possibility of revolution loomed large over four continents, and that revolutions were erupting everywhere. Janet, would you broadly tell us about these revolutions that were erupting everywhere? What was in the air, so to speak, around the Atlantic world between 1776 and 1804? And why do we call this the Age of Revolutions? I think this was actually a much rowdier period, a more interesting period, a much more tumultuous period than we depict in our histories of the American and the French revolutions and of founding fathers and even of the guillotine. So if you read the documents left behind by the people who participated in the revolutions, there's a real sense not only in America and in France but throughout what historians call the Atlantic world, that is the four continents and all the islands bordered by the Atlantic. So when you read their documents, for example, you find a Belgian pamphleteer, and there is no state of Belgium then, but in the provinces that will become Belgium, unfurling Dutch patriot flags over Utrecht. And what he writes is, over half of the globe, all men utter but one cry. They share but one desire, humanity united in action after being oppressed for so long under tyranny rises up with pride to reclaim a majestic and powerful liberty. And if you start looking, we find all of these hints of revolutions that then you have to investigate further that are going on in Geneva. Actually, there are two revolutions in Geneva just in the 1780s. There's revolution throughout Italy, in the Netherlands. There's revolutions that will come in Latin America and in the Caribbean. And even more recently, we've discovered not only revolutions among former American slaves, African-American slaves, who end up in West Africa, But there are also revolutions among the tribes in the Temne people, for example, in West Africa. So it's really a sense of immense possibility, I think, by people that everything is up for grabs. Everything is up to change. We sometimes forget that when we look at, for example, Thomas Paine's Common Sense. We have a relatively tame reading of it. When you think of the end that when Paine says, We have it to begin the world anew. I think that's really their sense of what they're able to do. That is, how can we reconstruct a totally new world? Was there any unifying theme that linked all these revolutions together? Or did all of these revolutions have different goals and different ideas about how they wanted to build a new world? That's one of the questions that historians ask each other as well is, is this really all one revolution? And one more specific way even to ask that is, did they mean the same thing when they used the word liberty? Because we see the word liberty coming up over and over again in revolutionary proclamations, in pamphlets, in newspapers. And so An obvious answer would be, well, of course not, that we find the word liberty, for example, one revolutionary would be the wife of a Dutch pastor who's writing a novel in a thatched garden shed 
she obviously means something different by liberty. She's talking about her family, and she's also talking about a larger political question. But that means something different than, for example, a free man of color who's storming Grand Riviere at the head of a hastily convened militia in the Caribbean. So they mean different things, but I think they're all related. And to use one of my colleague Elijah Gould's expressions, ideas entangled. That is seemingly what we would see as contradictory movements, different kinds of liberty, meaning religious liberty, looking for a nation's independence, liberty meaning freedom from slavery. I think they are all related to what one French lawyer turned philosopher by the name of Jacques-Pierre Brissot, he talked about the universal cry of liberty. And so I think that's what does tie these movements all together. It's this sense, again, of possibility. We would interpret it as freedom in all of the possibilities of that word. So I do think there is one common sense. You could almost see it as having different accents. Now, you've done a lot of research into how revolutionary ideas spread and how revolutions informed other revolutions during this age of revolutions. And I wonder if you would tell us about the ideas that spread from the American Revolution specifically. How did the American Revolution inform all of these other revolutions? Or what was the role of the American Revolution in this age of revolutions? Let me just give the example then to start back with the idea of Thomas Paine's Common Sense. So it's published in this country. You've talked in previous conversations about how the ideas of common sense, the American pamphlet spread up and down the eastern seaboard, but it also spread across the Atlantic. So merchants carried it across the Atlantic, and we actually have their accounts of them crossing the Atlantic. And in their trade, they go, for example, to Amsterdam and to The Hague in the Netherlands. When they get there, their ideas are picked up. That pamphlet is read, and we can read in the notations. If we find copies of the pamphlet, you see how it's been noted in the margins, and we can read who else read the pamphlet. Or it's picked up and reprinted in newspapers that are published in the Netherlands and then distributed throughout all of Europe. So that gives us some sense of how these ideas travel. What I like to say is these documents actually had legs. People carry documents with them. It's not only that they're sent places, but they will be carried. They will then be picked up by newspapers. This is a time when I talk to my students about plagiarism. They read newspapers and they say, ah, but it's the same exact story. And this paper is published in Paris. And this paper that's published in Warsaw and Poland, how can that be? And it's the way newspapers picked up stories. So they can take direct passages from one pamphlet, then distribute it, circulate it all around this Atlantic world. The idea is that documents have legs and that newspapers reprinted pamphlets passage by passage are actually great segues into Janet's research, where she found that revolutions and revolutionary ideas spread across the Atlantic world primarily in two ways, traveling revolutionaries and, as Janet just mentioned, through printed materials. Janet, let's talk about traveling revolutionaries. Would you tell us about travel during the late 18th and early 19th centuries? And what prompted people to travel during the age of revolutions? Sure. The late 18th century is a time when, and it's the first time really in world history, that travel isn't exclusively the domain of the wealthy and titled. We have examples before of the grand tour and of very wealthy aristocrats who, to educate their children, send them on this tour throughout Europe, for example. A lot of Americans made this grand tour. So then it was the preserve of the elite. And what changes in this period is that travel becomes possible for not everyone, obviously, but for men and women of modest means. That's not to say it was easy. They're not just buying a plane ticket and flying over to Europe. I think one of the best examples of how difficult the travel is, there's a collection of letters that tell us a lot about the travel in this period. 
And it's written between, oh, you could call him a poet, Joel Barlow and his wife, Ruth. And so Joel leaves and goes to Europe. And he writes back to Ruth, telling her of the conditions of sea travel. And as he's traveling, he tells her about the terrible food, about the incredible size of the waves that disrupt meals, and about how bored he is. And he's so happy when he gets there. He's, of course, when he's traveling, trying to play down what a great adventure this is because he's taken off and left her behind. But then when he decides he wants her to come and follow him, he writes this letter saying, oh, it's actually not so bad at all. It's just as easy as traveling from New Haven to, say, New York. Just have Abigail Adams tell you how to pack your trunks and then follow me and I'll meet you in London. Well, of course, she arrives and he isn't there. But she obviously had that letter that is now in the archives. And so it's really funny to see this connection. So travel is not easy. It's not easy either direction. But we have lots of examples of people who travel for business. That is, they're traveling from America to Europe to take their commercial enterprises. There are a number of Europeans who come over to the United States in this period because it seems to open this vast market for finished goods, for luxury goods from Europe, given the picture of America as this land of vast forests and just raw materials. So the assumption is there's a market there. So Europeans are also coming over to America with their expectations of establishing trading routes. So there's a lot of travel back and forth then for commerce. Thomas Jefferson's next door neighbor, for example, Filippo Matsai, comes over and he has actually talked with Benjamin Franklin and he's talking about what kinds of imports and exports he can start developing. When he gets there, he meets Thomas Jefferson. He starts farming. They start all sorts of experimental exercises where they're bringing over crops from Italy, especially from Tuscany, and trying to grow them with very limited success, actually, in Virginia. And Matsai is then going to take back all sorts of goods from America to take back to Europe. So there's reasons for business travel or traveling for adventure. If you read the letters of Lafayette, when he leaves the first time and comes over to America, he tells his wife as he's writing her this letter aboard ship, and he says, I'm going to discover liberty. Well, we can read it now as he's going to discover the liberty of the American Revolution. Well, instead, I think what he actually means is he's liberating himself from what he saw as a stultifying need to go dancing in London and a culture that had little place for him as a clumsy aristocrat. So there's that sense, too, of adventure. There's also travel where a spouse goes to join another husband or a wife who's a diplomat. So we see all sorts of reasons for travel. And then because this is a revolutionary period, there are so many people who are a freed slave called it roving. And if they're forced out of one country because a revolution fails, they have to go somewhere else. And what's maybe also important to notice in this period is we think of traveling of needing passports noticing borders, having border controls. This is really a period where people aren't stopped by borders. You don't really notice when you're crossing from one country into another. It's before we have the formal limits on travel. Travel is assumed to be a basic human right. It's a basic human right that's established in the Enlightenment as our natural right to free movement and our right to settle anywhere, and Immanuel Kant called it the need for hospitality. That is, we should have a right to a home, and we should welcome strangers. So it's a period that I think is much more open to travel than we sometimes remember. It's not only modern times that see people moving from one place to another and not just settling down. So it sounds like people really traveled for the same reasons that we travel today, to see and experience a new culture, for business, a need for adventure. I mean, 
they weren't just traveling in the age of revolutions to revolution hop or to try and chase down these different revolutions. No. And in fact, I think it's incidental that they find different revolutions. It's rather that they end up observing where they end up. And I think for some of the same reasons that we all tell our students that they should study abroad, there is a real sense among travelers that they see the world differently. And sometimes when I'm thinking of the travelers, for example, there's an American named Alcano Watson, and he's someone who's participated in the American Revolution. He smuggled funds and he traveled up and down the seacoast on horseback to carry messages, but he's still a mere apprentice. So he ends up going to France and supposedly taking messages over to American diplomats who are in France. And he finds himself, after he's landed, first of all, when he lands, he says, everybody looked at us very strangely. When an American ship landed, he said, they all expected Native Americans to come off the ship. And they were very disappointed that we looked so much like they did. But again, you see him traveling up to Paris and Versailles, and everything is new to him. So that when he arrives at Benjamin Franklin's house, who's staying in a smaller house on an aristocrat's property, so Franklin invites him to go to dinner. And so Watson goes into the dinner with Franklin, and he immediately comes upon these two very well-dressed gentlemen as he walks in the door, and he assumes they must be gracious aristocrats. And so he bows, and everyone starts laughing. Well, they're the servants of the household. And he realizes how out of place he is and how everything is so different. And he writes back and talks about how you see the world differently when everything is new. That what you see is what other people who have lived there forever take for granted. And so you notice the differences. In his journal, he's constantly comparing. And I think it's that sense of understanding a different culture that we see in travelers. It's what Kwame Apia called being used to difference. And I think that's what we see in these travelers, which is what makes their documents so interesting. And then also when they go back home, if they've been away for a long time, they're really shocked by what they find when they get home because that looks different too. And I guess we have that experience also when our students come back, our children come back from studying abroad and they begin questioning what had seemed so typical and normal and had just been accepted without question before. So suddenly to them, America seems different. And that's true of these travelers coming back as well. They will come back to America and begin to question slavery, for example, in ways that Americans who had been settled and there all their lives did not. Now, Elkana Watson was someone who had very strong opinions about, well, basically everything. Everything. (laughs) And we have both the journals that he wrote in the moment of his travels and sections of those journals, which he revised and published years later as individual books. So how did travelers like Watson spread their ideas about the revolutions they participated in and witnessed? Did they circulate their original journals or just their revised published volumes? And while we're talking about this, how do we in the present account for the fact that There are these two similar but not identical records about the Age of Revolutions in our archives. Right. And we know that someone like Alcana Watson kept all these different versions because luckily they have survived. And for every document that survived, we always wonder about all those that didn't, of course. But Watson's journals are all in the New York State Archives. And so I think it's fascinating. We can see the notes he took on site. And keeping a travel journal was a form of literature. There are manuals instructing travelers about how to record what they've seen. And it says that you should take notes on site. You should take them immediately. The council should take them in shorthand. So you should chronicle exactly what you're seeing. And then from that, you should every evening write down exactly what you've seen. And so in longer form, 
and then keep them in an orderly fashion until you're somewhere where you can actually then compile them. So we've got all of his notes with all their crossings out. And luckily, you can read what was crossed out. They obviously never intended historians to find that. So we've got the different journals, a journal A, a journal B, and a journal C. Then he comes back and he rewrites them. And so we've got the more polished version, but it's not only the sentences that become more polished, it's his ideas. So you can see his ideas changing as he rethinks what he said. And and a lot of times we're more interested, I think, in his first impressions in that first scrawled journal. And they really are very hard to read. And as they become more polished, they tell us, I think, in some ways less as they go along. He then kept those journals, so his nephew ends up publishing them. And often what we find is that someone else found these journals in an attic somewhere, and a relative will take them and will publish them for their own purposes, it must be pointed out. So they will sometimes shorten them. And then you wonder if you don't see the original, what actually was left out of them. But one of the main sources we have for understanding what happened are these journals that are left by men, they're left by women. And we also have narratives left behind, for example, when the Black loyalists, that is the slaves who were freed by the British because they were on American plantations. So the slaves who go with the British and go to Nova Scotia, and from Nova Scotia, they end up traveling to West Africa in the newly founded Sierra Leone. And when they're settling in Sierra Leone, several of them go back to London after they've been in Sierra Leone, and they're sponsored by churches. They go back and they write their memoirs. Well, this is years after they've left, but that gives us an account on their journey. That's going to be very different from someone like Watson, who is writing down every night what's happened. And it's going to be written then so the earliest experiences are obviously influenced by what has intervened. So we find a lot of talk in their accounts that are published in religious magazines of the time. We find in their accounts a lot about salvation and about how they found their way, which would be very different from someone accounting day by day what is going on. But they're all of the same piece, I think. So what we as historians do is to put these stories together and to try to figure out where their stories fit Um, one to another. So these journals really tell us how people came by and developed their ideas about different revolutions and how they spread those ideas. I mean, they witnessed a revolution while at home or while traveling, then took notes about what they saw, and then either kept those notes private or sometimes shared their journals or just entries from them with close friends and family members. Right. And a lot of them are written in the form of letters to friends as if they're correspondence. So they really are then thinking about, as they publish them, what they want to tell friends at home of what they've seen. There's a traveler, Helen Maria Williams, who leaves England. She's written some poetry and she's made the acquaintance of a younger couple who couldn't marry for various reasons under pre-revolutionary France, and they were from different backgrounds, and so her father had prevented them from marrying. So she ends up at their invitation coming to France. Well, she arrives just on the eve of the Festival of Federation, and she keeps her journal. So the first thing she sees as she comes out in the morning is this Festival of Federation, and she sees everybody gathering on this large plain in the center of Paris. And she sees Lafayette coming in on his white horse, and she sees all of these delegations from different countries. And she says, who at that moment could have not been a citizen of the world? So she's 
trying to convey to her English friends this spirit of cosmopolitanism, this spirit of universal possibility. She does then publish her journals. And I think what's interesting, the publication of these journals and of narratives, we know they're one of the most sought after forms of publication. That is, publishers are writing about how everybody wants them. People who are stuck in their armchairs want to read about worlds far away. So it's a really popular form of literature. And in some ways, they're intended to bring cultures closer together. That is, Americans writing about Europe for an American audience. It's intended to bridge that gap of the ocean. But I think they have unintended consequences, which is actually, if you look at them, what they do. And you could say the same thing of travel literature today. Helen Maria Williams' message that she intended was one of universality. But as she's describing the French people and that she's describing the world of French women, for example, and her reception in a club of revolutionary French women, what it actually does, I think, for its English readers, which is where it's published, is it emphasizes the difference between England and France. So Unlike other forms of literature in this period, I think what happens with these journals and the published travel narratives is it actually emphasizes difference, even if the intent was to bring people closer together. Because then the reaction of English readers to Helen Maria Williams' journals, especially when she describes later on in a subsequent, it's a multi-volume set of works, when she describes the reactions in England to her description of the storming of the Tuileries, she at that point in the violence, and she talks rather matter-of-factly about stumbling over the heads of two members of the Swiss Guard who had formerly obviously been guarding the king and have been left dead on the grounds. Her readers are horrified that the woman is experiencing this. And they write and say, you should come home. And what right does a woman have to be discussing politics? So it emphasizes difference there rather than bringing her readers closer to understanding her point of view. There's another example, though, which is a freed slave named Equiano writes his memoirs, and they're published and go through many editions. So he writes about what he says are, and it's up for debate, he depicts his birth in Africa, growing up in this culture that helped build each other's houses where they looked after each other's children. The people he describes as barbarians are the American slave traders. And so he gives his perspective then on the Middle Passage on coming over to America and how families were rent apart and he's taken away from his sister and thrown into a world where no one speaks his own language. So the barbarians at this point in his narrative are the white people. And then he talks about finding Christianity, but he's very articulate. And so his white English readers would have seen this account as destroying their preconceptions of identity. In other words, here is this black man, here is this Christian recounting the slave life and recounting the Middle Passage. So in some ways, that kind of narrative will then bring them closer to understanding the world through different eyes. Now, another way that people attempted to make sense of revolutions, spread revolutionary ideas, and even tried to foment revolutions was with rumors. And after we talk about our sponsor, I'd like for us to talk about rumors and specifically about the role they played in revolutionary movements. This episode is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. As both Paul and Janet have mentioned, the Age of Revolutions was a rather large period, one that may account for nearly a century's worth of history. Would you like to know more about the hows and whys of this tumultuous period? The Great Courses Plus has you covered. They have a course called The Long 19th Century European History from 1789 to 1917, 
It's a course you can explore for free during the one month unlimited trial The Great Courses Plus is offering you when you visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld. In the long 19th century, Professor Robert Weiner will lead you on a detailed investigation of the Age of Revolutions and beyond. Among the 36 30-minute long video lectures in this course, you'll find a lecture called The Age of Revolution, 1789 to 1848, where Professor Weiner focuses specifically on the period we've been discussing and on how the French and Industrial Revolutions brought modern European history and modern world history into being. Plus, when you visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld, you'll find that The Great Courses Plus has dozens of other courses about history and over 8,500 lectures available across a wide variety of topics like science, math, psychology, and personal development and through its how-to courses on topics such as photography, cooking, and learning new languages. All of these fascinating lectures are presented by award-winning professors and experts in easy-to-watch 30-minute long videos that you can stream, download, and watch all on your own schedule and on all your favorite mobile devices. So visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld to extend your exploration of history and to delve into new topics that fascinate you. To claim your free one-month unlimited trial of all the Great Courses Plus courses, visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld. Janet, would you tell us about rumors during the Age of Revolutions and specifically about the role they played in different revolutionary movements? Sure. So ideas travel through written documents. We have pamphlets, so we know what people read. We have journals. We have letters that people sent back and forth. But what about all the people who didn't write? What about people who didn't read? So this is a period when a lot more people are reading and writing, but not everyone. And Laurent Dubois writes about rumors, and he writes about reading them against the grain. So if we look, for example, at the revolutions that are breaking out in the same time in the Caribbean, there are rumors spreading, for example, that there is a rebellion that's going to break out in Jamaica at just about the same time as the American Revolution. What happens as these rumors spread? Someone hears them. Someone follows them up. Someone then can try to squelch the revolution that they think is about to break out. We see this throughout the Caribbean, and there are many different ways of interpreting or reading these rumors. And part of the question is, how do we even know about the rumors? Obviously, they're not self-circulating. What we know is rumors do at some point get written down. That is, for example, a plantation owner or manager or a governor of an island will write back and will say, I heard that, or so-and-so came in and reported that. So what it is, is basically how we maybe know today what was being planned, what possibilities for revolution existed in communities on slave plantations, among the free people of color. Now, it really surprised the white rulers of islands. So the plantation owners would be shocked that their slaves apparently got information before they did. That is, this is a time when we have to remember how slow official correspondence can be. It could take from September to December for news either of, for example, of a king being overthrown, unseated in Europe for that to get to the Caribbean. But once that news gets to the Caribbean, it comes aboard shore. So yes, there will be official correspondence, but there are also all of the people who are working in the harbor. And what astonishes the plantation owners is That even before they can get back to their plantations, it seems like the news has already gotten there first. And so there's a real concern. How does news travel so quickly? And there are attempts, for example, the king of France, obviously, before he's beheaded, the king of France worrying about news of the French Revolution spreading to the Caribbean and to the very wealthy French colonies. So what he does is he bans printing presses and he thinks, aha, okay, I've gotten rid of the written word. There won't be a problem. Ideas won't spread. 
Well, that doesn't help at all. It doesn't do much to stop the spread of rumors. So I think what we see with these rumors is that their networks are flourishing in a way that whites can't even imagine, that there is this formidable chain of oral communication. And what's interesting as well is that managers are blaming rumors. That is, there's that real fear of what they call the contagion of revolutionary principles. What these managers don't see is what also foments rumors, helps the spread of rumors, spreads revolution, which is the harsh conditions on the plantations themselves. And it starts in Jamaica. One doctor writes a friend in Edinburgh, for example, and says, Dear liberty has rang in the heart of every housebred slave in one form or the other for these 10 years past. And he blames the too careless of expressions, meaning that white people talked at the dinner table and that that news then spread throughout the whole plantation. And they complain in their letters about what gossiping of idle folks may produce. So what happens is when they hear rumors, there's fear, but when they don't hear what's going on, it gets to be the sense of what possibilities are lurking all around them on their plantations. In Le Cop, for example, in Saint-Domingue, one white plantation owner writes back to France and says, one feared being slaughtered by one's own servants. So it's not only that the threat lurks outside, it also, they think, begins to lurk inside their houses. So it's this question, if there are 50,000 slaves who are divided into all these different plantations, how can they coalesce? What is it is, I think, what the white writers of the correspondence that we still have are asking, because these rumors are traveling faster than official correspondence. And as these rumors are reported, for example, back to France, one writer, a traveler, Moreau de Saint-Marie, writes and says, What happens is it spreads so quickly because, he says, it's all part of a so-called plan of true happiness that would end up setting the whole world ablaze. In other words, what they're saying is, yes, revolution is fine in Europe, and it's fine as far as it went in the American colonies, but it would be very dangerous if it spreads among the enslaved who so greatly outnumber the plantation owners in the colonies. So it's this sense of fear. And we know about them because we can read between the lines of the correspondence that's sent back and forth that tell us both of the rumors that are heard, some of which are not true at all, but also then of the rumors that actually do tell us something about what transpires. So we have letters, we have journals, and we even have rumors all at work spreading revolutionary ideas and impressions around the Atlantic world. And there were also newspaper clubs. Now, we know from speaking with Rob Parkinson in episode 144 that newspapers played a big role in conveying information and ideas during revolutions, specifically during the American Revolution. Yet clubs where people read newspapers also played a big role in spreading revolutionary ideas, especially in Europe. Janet, would you tell us about newspaper clubs and the roles they played in European revolutions like the French Revolution? So where do people come together? Where do they get their ideas? Well, this is a period where not everyone reads. And so we know that people gather in clubs where other people will read newspapers aloud We know that we can't look at daily circulation to individuals because a lot of times newspapers would be gathered in cafes or in clubs and people would come there and read them. And in fact, there's stories of French clubs where they actually had to anchor down the newspaper so no one could walk off with it. And there was a line to read these newspapers. So we have records of these clubs and we know about the French clubs, the Jacobins. So this is sort of intertwined because there are newspaper descriptions about artisans who come in for the first time and where they find conversations about politics. And I think in clubs and in their descriptions in newspapers, what we find is what one historian, John Brewer, has referred to as an alternative sphere of politics. 
there is a sense in which politics no longer, and if we talk about travel being now open to men and women of modest means, so is politics. And even if they're not exactly welcomed in by those who are founding fathers and heads of government, there is a sense in which politics belongs to everyone. And that's what I mean by this, and that's what historians have meant by this alternative sphere of politics. Men and women will gather, and women come as well, will gather in clubs and will talk about political ideas. They assume it is their right to discuss how they should be governed. So that, for example, we see clubs, there's the London Corresponding Society in London, which starts in the 1790s. And that's mostly men. They talk about coming and putting their dues, which are very modest, into the kitty and drinking and smoking and talking about politics of the day. Now, not only are they talking about what's going on in Britain, but they're also talking about the French Revolution. And together, these British clubs, for example, will send delegates to Paris to meet with the French revolutionaries and to offer their support and actually a lot of Paris's shoes. So we see this correspondence among clubs. And it's not only where we would go, London and Paris, but also between the French Jacobin clubs in Paris, for example, and Jacobin clubs in Poland. And there is correspondence between these clubs. So there's a real fear throughout the rest of Europe that this French Revolution is going to spread. And it's going to spread not at the level of governments, but it's going to spread at the more grassroots level of these clubs. And these clubs that are then being informed by newspapers that come in the post and that bring news of revolution around the world. It really seems from your research that one of the reasons that the Age of Revolutions took place was because there was all this information circulating around the Atlantic world, talking about revolutions, the ideas of revolutions, and even rumors about revolutions. Yes. So I would say that we think of the revolutions as circumscribed by the nation state. We think of the American Revolution and we think of the French Revolution. And what we forget is that in this period, there are all these revolutions between the American and the French Revolution. There's revolutions that are starting in the Netherlands. There's revolutions starting in the Belgian provinces. There are revolutions starting all throughout the Italian peninsula. There's a revolution starting in Ireland. There's revolutions starting in West Africa. There are revolutions starting throughout the Caribbean. And what we forget is this sense of possibility for all of the world to be participating in this revolution. And someone might say, well, so what happened to those other revolutions? Why don't we know about them now? Why do we just talk about the American and the French revolutions? And as one of my students said, the other revolutions happened in a bad neighborhood. That is often revolutions, the smaller revolutions got squelched, put down by imperial troops from empires so that the Prussians were pretty good about invading and putting down revolutions, the Austrians did, and even the French. So the French helped the American Revolution, and then they turn around and put down the Genevan Revolution. They refused to help the Dutch. So it's partially a question of where revolutions are happening as to whether or not they succeed. So I think what we forget is this sense of possibility and this sense of interconnection among the revolutionaries that people at the time didn't necessarily, and I'm not talking about founding fathers, but the people who traveled didn't think within national borders that their ideas, like those of the Enlightenment, really transcended those borders. So with all of this information circulating around the Atlantic world about revolutions, and with all of these other revolutions erupting in Europe, the Caribbean, and South America, how did Americans respond? All of these revolutions were taking place after their revolution. So what did they think of this age and about all of these other successful and failed revolutions? 
So at first, I think the Americans are quite excited when they get news of these other revolutions, and there's a lot of taking credit for the revolutions. So initially, there's real celebration, and there's the sense of a connection between, for example, the American and the Dutch revolutions. When John Adams is over trying to get recognition of the American nation and money from the Dutch as they're just about to revolt, he writes back and talks about all these possibilities in the Netherlands that are inspired by American ideas. What he gets really upset by, though, is when the Dutch refer to themselves as the chosen people, that they are the people who will bring liberty. And he writes back and says, no, we Americans are the chosen people. Who do you think you are, the Dutch? But otherwise, there's a real sense of connection. And if you look at the pamphlets that are written, say, in the Belgian provinces or the pamphlets in Geneva, often pamphlets are written as if they're conversations. And one of the parties to the conversation will very often be, for example, someone who's called the Philadelphian or will be someone from America who is the correspondent in the pamphlet. So the Europeans are also seeing, the Genevans, the Belgians, the Dutch, are seeing these connections to ideas in the American Revolution. And I think for American revolutionaries, who don't envision themselves as going off as the French do and conquering other peoples. It's their ideas that spread and that they see that strong connection. That works until the 1790s, until I think the revolutions, I think they're scared by how radical the French Revolution becomes. So in the beginning, there's a sense of connection with the French. In 1789, there's a sense of celebration among the Americans of the French Revolution and of these ideas of liberty and equality. That's why you see Thomas Jefferson, who's in Paris at the time of the writing of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, proposing, coming up with ideas for connection. In fact, the French revolutionaries asked Jefferson if they could gather in his house to write the declaration, and that doesn't go over very well. He says, I don't think I should really be participating in overthrowing the government that's hosting me as a diplomat. So no, he doesn't allow that, but he's certainly part of these conversations. So what we see is this sense of connection of the American Revolution in 1789 and of revolutionary possibilities. When it seems that the French Revolution has become more radical after 1792 with the Jacobins, and then certainly by the time French armies begin to spread their revolution with bayonets, when they're invading other countries, at that point, there's a real movement among the Americans to distance themselves from the French Revolution and to say that's something completely different from what we've done. So at that point in the 1790s, I think you see this pulling away and this real attempt to control what's going on in America as well. It's the time of the Alien and Sedition Acts, attempt to control speech. It's a time when you really see this debate going on in the newspapers about the French. And it wasn't always that way. That is, originally in the newspapers, you even see American newspapers earlier on printing what the French Jacobin Robespierre was saying about press freedom. That's not happening in the 1790s. There's a real sense of branding of the French as overly enthusiastic, is the way one American puts it. Let's move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Janet, as you mentioned, there were many revolutions that took place during the Age of Revolutions, some of which were successful, like the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and the Haitian Revolution, and many of which had failed. So, in your opinion, What would have happened if all or more of the revolutions that took place during the Age of Revolutions had succeeded? 
would have happened is we'd have a lot of different models for revolutions. And I think we'd understand the world differently than we do just looking at the American and the French revolutions as stories of national founding. I think if we saw all the revolutions connected together, maybe instead of seeing this as foundational period for nationalism, we might also understand it as the beginning or the growth of a period of cosmopolitanism, of universalism. And I'm thinking of that because also of all of the different possibilities of revolution. That is, the other revolutions, the smaller ones, revolutions in Africa, revolutions in the Caribbean didn't all look like the American and the French revolutions. And I think then when we try to understand uprisings in our own world today, I think what we would see, for example, if we looked at the Arab Spring, I think we would have seen it very differently. We wouldn't be as baffled. For example, the Tunisians and the Libyans didn't follow the path of George Washington, but we would have seen all of these other possibilities. And we'd understand this revolutionary borrowing from one culture to another, that ideas of citizenship get built from different bases so that, for example, we would understand, I think, looking at the Black loyalist in Sierra Leone, that their idea of liberty comes from the American Revolution, certainly, and the ideals of liberty that they picked up there. And in part, that's also liberty means owning property, which is a right they're going to insist on when they get to Freetown in Sierra Leone. But they're also bringing in ideals from the British, and they're bringing in ideals from France. And I think we would understand how all of these ideas are entangled and interconnected. So I think we might have a different understanding of our own world if we were telling the story of this revolutionary possibility and of ideas that traveled around the world and of travelers and of interconnections and of what Apia calls getting used to other ideas. Janet, now that you've investigated how revolutions and revolutionary ideas circulated throughout the age of revolutions, what aspect of history are you researching and writing about now? My last chapter in Revolutions Without Borders ends with the revolutionaries who can't go home or who try to go home. In fact, in that chapter, I talk about Rip Van Winkle and the sense of falling asleep and not fitting back into the society where he wakes up. I think that's the sense of many of these revolutionaries who feel like they stayed awake. And when they got home, their settled neighbors had been asleep. So these travelers have so many different ideas. They see slavery differently, for example. They can't fit in. But it's also the sense that when you asked about why people traveled, a lot of people became refugees. That is, when all these revolutions, quote, failed, meaning they didn't establish nation states, when they were put down by armies of their larger neighbors, it sent the revolutionary leaders from those countries fleeing And sometimes they ended up in the midst of other revolutions. So one Dutch patriot writer, Henry Pop, talks about participating in four different revolutions. And he says, what could be better than that? But there's this sense of what happens to these people who are basically stateless, who end up cast out of their national base and their home, as they would see it, and are abroad in the world. So I wanted to pick up their stories. I think very few of the revolutionary travelers that I chronicle in Revolutions Without Borders actually end up able to settle back home. Anna Falkenbridge makes it to Sierra Leone. She writes about it. And when she comes back, she's totally disillusioned about this project of setting up this free colony. And she leaves her memoirs behind for us to read. But I don't think she ever is really able to settle back in. So my next book is about refugees and especially about political refugees. So in some ways, what I'm doing is taking this question of cosmopolitanism and nationalism from revolutions without borders and extending it through time to 1848. Where is the best place to contact you if we have questions about the age of revolutions and 
how revolutions and revolutionary ideas spread across the Atlantic world? Probably the best way to contact me is by email. My email is janet.polaski, P-O-L-A-S-K-Y, at U-N-H dot E-D-U. And I'm always happy to get questions and to refer people to other places to read or to follow up on questions. So yes, I would very much welcome hearing from people. Janet Pulaski, thank you so much for taking us through the age of revolutions and for showing us not only how revolutionary ideas spread, but also how some of those ideas and even the revolutions intersected. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. Did the age of revolutions represent just one large revolution? As Janet noted, this is a question historians ask and can't definitively answer. What we do know is that people around the Atlantic world saw the late 18th and early to mid 19th centuries as being an age of immense possibility, where it seemed possible to begin the world anew. We see their ideas and grand visions through the printed and manuscript materials they left behind. In these documents, we see that many people around the Atlantic talked about liberty and how it seemed possible to affect changes that would build a new world. A world that contained greater liberty, equality, and more widespread participation in government. This documentary evidence also gives us insight into how revolutions and revolutionary ideas spread across the Atlantic world during this period. People and documents had legs. People wrote about their ideas for what they thought would make a better world, and then other people carried those ideas in the form of handwritten letters, printed pamphlets, and newspaper articles to different parts of the Atlantic. And wherever these ideas ended up, people read and discussed them. Revolutions and revolutionary ideas spread during this period because people wrote, people talked, and the economic conditions of the time made it easier and cheaper to travel than it had ever been during the earlier part of the 18th century. Plus, travel also encouraged the development of new ideas about the world and its conditions. Travelers witnessed and immersed themselves in new cultures, which in turn impacted how they saw their home societies and governments. The circulation of people and revolutionary ideas shows us just how interconnected the Atlantic world was, and it was this interconnectedness that made the Age of Revolutions possible. Even Americans who lived in this period saw this interconnectedness. They recognized it every time they wrote about how ideas from Europe informed the ideas and goals of their revolution. They recognized it every time a ship arrived in their harbors from some other part of the Atlantic world with cargoes of gunpowder, weapons, and other war materiel that they needed to wage their revolutionary war. They also recognized it later when they dispatched their own ships full of foodstuffs, money, and other materiel that would help revolutionaries in other places wage their revolutions. And we also see it when we explore the fear Americans had when revolutions in places like France and Haiti became too radical and too violent to fit within their notions of revolution. The interconnected and often borderless nature of the Atlantic world made the Age of Revolutions possible. And as Janet revealed, we stand to gain a great deal of knowledge and a better appreciation for this age when we take the time to explore not just the revolutions that succeeded, but the revolutions that failed too. Because all of these revolutions reveal the immense sense of possibility and the need to rise up and actively build a better world that the people of the late 18th and early to mid 19th centuries saw and felt. Look for more information about Paul Mapp, Janet Pulaski, and their publications, plus notes for everything we talked about today, on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 165. Ben Franklin's World and the Doing History to the Revolution series are productions of the Omohundro Institute. Be sure you're subscribed to Ben Franklin's World so that you don't forget to download next week's episode. Episode 166 will be the last episode in our Doing History to the Revolution series. Today's episode was sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. To claim the one-month unlimited trial of all its courses, visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld. Finally, what do you think made the Age of Revolutions, and thereby the American Revolution, possible? Send your answers to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.